The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. I'm Ashley McEdron. I am here with Michelle Alexander. She's a civil rights advocate and author of The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Um, your book covers a lot of complex issues, race, the justice system. How do you talk about these issues to college students and, and why should they be concerned with the issues that you discuss in your book? Well, I think young people should be critically <laughs> concerned with these issues mm -hmm. because in my view, mass incarceration is the most pressing racial justice issue of our time. And historically, young people have been at the forefront mm -hmm. of movements um, to dismantle systems of oppression and yes. control and to challenge the status quo when it is revealed to be unjust. And it's really my great hope and prayer <laughs> that young people uh, of this generation mm -hmm. will you know, awaken to the reality um, mm -hmm. of what mass incarceration is and the harm that it has done and will raise their voices uh, and organize in a way that will end not just this latest caste-like mm -hmm. system, mass incarceration, um, but also build a new moral consensus that will prevent anything like it from ever emerging again. Do you see an interest among students once you speak to them or maybe they find out more about these topics? Absolutely. You know, there are so many myths that sustain the system mm -hmm. of mass incarceration. Um, the myth that our prison explosion has been driven by crime and crime rates, which is not true. Uh, the myth that, you know, people of color are more likely to use or sell mm -hmm. illegal drugs, you know, it's not true. Um, there's so many myths. Um, about the system that, you know, once they're dispelled and people recognize the magnitude yeah. of the harm that's been done, um, they're eager to take action. And I find especially encouraging the fact that on campuses around the country now, there's student groups forming, um, Students Against Mass Incarceration, yeah. on a number of campuses around the country where students are coming together and saying, you know, we want to define our role and find our voice uh, at this time. And I find that just so encouraging and a real hopeful sign. Yeah, that's great. Um, I guess going back to you are talking about the myth with uh, concerning using and drugs mm -hmm. and, and who is, I guess, distributing or using. You're going to be talking about mass incarceration used as a tool for social control. Mm -hmm. How does that tie into the war on drugs? And has the war on drugs, in fact, done more harm than good? Yes, absolutely. It has. The war on drugs has really been the engine of mass incarceration. Within a 30 year period of time, our nation's prison population quintupled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is extraordinary, um, the rate of increase in such incredibly short period of time. And much of that increase was driven by the war on drugs. For example, um, between 1985 and 2000, uh, the period of the, our greatest expansion of our prison system, um, more than half of the increase in the state prison population and two-thirds of the increase in the federal prison population was due to drug convictions alone. Mm -hmm. You know, drug convictions have increased more than 1,000 percent since the drug war began. Um, so this war on drugs really has been the mechanism by which young people, particularly young black and brown men, mm -hmm. um, have been targeted by the police, stopped, frisked, searched, arrested for, you know, typically, you know, minor, nonviolent, mm -hmm. drug-related offenses swept in to the criminal justice system and then once you're swept in you're really trapped for life mm -hmm. uh, even if you're lucky enough to get just felony probation um, you will acquire a criminal record that will follow you for the rest of your life and authorize legal discrimination against you in employment housing access to education mm -hmm. and public benefits so this war on drugs um, has turned out to be less of a war on 
a substance uh -huh. <laughs> or set of substances and instead more of a war on a group of people defined largely by race and class and it has served to relegate millions to a permanent second class status not unlike uh, the second class status occupied by African Americans uh, you know in an earlier era. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we as a nation are so concerned with punishing people for possessing marijuana or nonviolent crimes and, and putting them in prison for nonviolent crimes and things that aren't, you know, as, I guess, violent as we, you know, would think of other offenses. Why are we so focused on that in this country? Well, you know, it's interesting because we're not obsessed with punishing all people mm -hmm. for minor nonviolent drug related offenses. We're focused on punishing some people for those crimes and who does time for these nonviolent mm -hmm. drug offenses are overwhelmingly black and brown even though studies have consistently shown for decades that people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs mm -hmm. than whites you know poor folks of color have been targeted at grossly disproportionate rates in some states 80 to 90 percent of all drug offenders sent to prison have been African-American. Um, so this punitive impulse hasn't been directed at all drug users. If you're you know, white and lived in, live in a relatively privileged neighborhood um, and you possess marijuana, um, the odds are extremely small that you're going to be stopped and frisked and searched mm -hmm. by the police. And even if you get caught <laughs> with marijuana, you know, the odds of you actually going to jail or doing prison time for that offense are you know, slim to none, um, but for people of color, um, the odds are high. Um, and you know, what is that punitive impulse mm -hmm. about? Our impulse to punish poor folks of color for these relatively minor crimes that go largely ignored, you know, in other communities. I think that impulse, unfortunately, is linked to our racial history. It's due to racial stereotypes, anxieties, fears, and resentments that linger on um, and that we have not fully overcome even as we elect our nation's first black president and you know, all appearances, on the surface at least, you know, suggest that we're moving in the right direction. And that actually was my third question was, uh, what do you say to people who argue that race is no longer an issue and you just made a very, very uh, valid case for why it definitely still is. What do you, do you think we're moving forward with this younger generation uh, of people say maybe 18 to 25? Do you feel that it's, uh, it's becoming less of an issue or they care more about it and they recognize uh, the problem that it still is? Well, you know, appearances can be deceiving and on the surface of things, um, I think it appears as though we've made great progress in race relations. Obviously, the election of Barack Obama, which is something that would have been unthinkable mm -hmm. um, you know, several decades ago, shows that attitudes have changed in important ways on issues of race. Mm -hmm. um, but at a deeper level, on a more unconscious level, our beliefs about who's deserving and who's undeserving, um, who's more likely to be violent and criminal, mm -hmm. um, who's lazy and unwilling to work, mm -hmm. um, our ideas about certain populations defined by race have remained remarkably constant over time, even if it's become impolite to say it out loud. Mm -hmm. And even if many of these stereotypes, um, you know, we don't want to admit to ourselves, we may have. Um, one of the most fascinating things that, you know, I think psychologists have discovered in recent years is how much racial bias um, people of all colors harbor even when they have no desire at all to be racist. Mm -hmm. um, and how alarmed people are to discover that, you know, if they're given a simulated test where they're, you know, shown images in a split second and have to make decisions about whether they're going to shoot, you know, an mm -hmm. imaginary intruder, how likely they are to shoot, you know, the black 
mm -hmm. imaginary intruder rather than the white, um, how likely employers are to uh, deny job opportunities to African Americans but grant, you know, identically qualified, you know, white folks um, a shot at the job. And, you know, so these stereotypes and attitudes continue um, to drive decision making by individuals, attitudes, perceptions, and you know, at a larger societal level, they manifest themselves um, through the kinds of get tough punitive policies aimed at you know, folks locked in ghetto communities, mm -hmm. um, even while we consciously like to believe um, that we're colorblind and somehow past <laughs> all of that. So we've we've come a long way but we still have a long way to go. Yes, and although, you know, I think that it's a mistake to think of it just in purely linear terms. Mm -hmm. Because in so many ways these systems of racial and social control have morphed mm -hmm. and changed and to say are we better off today than we were during the Jim Crow era? depends a lot upon where someone finds themselves um, within you know any given system of racial or social control so for example you know if you're a young black man would you rather um, be living in the Jim Crow era in the south but be living at home with both parents who mm -hmm. um, are there and present for you and may be employed and you may have to sit at the back of the bus and suffer a lot of shame and humiliation, but you're not doing a life sentence for first-time drug possession. You know, the U.S. Supreme Court has upheld life sentences for first-time drug offenses yeah. against an Eighth Amendment challenge that such sentences are cruel and unusual punishment. And so there's people doing life sentences, sometimes in solitary confinement. Um, for relatively minor crimes, are they better off or worse off? Um, and the social forces, you know, the racial attitudes and anxieties that created the Jim Crow regime are the same ones that, in a different fashion, helped to give birth to mass incarceration. And so um, I think rather than saying, you know, how much further do we have to go, I think it's more important to say, you know, what is the work that's necessary? to dismantle this latest system of control and to ensure that nothing like it uh, is ever born again uh, in the United States or for that matter anywhere else in the world. Well thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us and we look forward to your speech tonight. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.